Superstars and celebrities are always in the limelight. We get to see their best moments captured by the camera lens and through our screens all the time. However, sometimes cameras manage to seize their most vulnerable, raw, and hauntingly fragile moments to the point that the world sees them slipping into the embrace of death. Here are the top 10 dark last recordings of celebrities. Paul Walker Paul Walker posted on Twitter on November 28, 2013 to wish his followers a happy Thanksgiving. That year, the Fast and the Furious actor had plenty to be thankful for. He was beginning to make his own movies, and the sixth entry of his beloved film series had shattered box office records. But Paul Walker passed away suddenly two days later. Walker was well known for his charitable work, had spent November 30, 2013 at a toy drive for his disaster relief organization Reach Out Worldwide, which was established in the wake of the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Just before 3.30 p.m., Walker left merrily, never to be seen alive again. Paul Walker, 40, shared a passion for fast cars with Brian O'Connor, the character he played in Fast and Furious. In fact, Walker and his friend Roger Rodas, a high-performance car shop in Santa Clarita, California, hosted the charity event that day. Walker and Rodas organized the event to aid the Filipino survivors of Typhoon Haiyan. Rodas drove the 2005 Porsche Carrera GT, and Walker sat in the passenger seat as the two left the event. Only a few hundred yards from the shop, Rodas lost control of the notorious difficult-to-handle car. The Porsche struck a curve, a tree, a light post, and then another tree as it was moving at about 100 miles per hour before catching fire. Everyone at the charity event, including Rodas's young son, came running right after hearing the explosion. According to Walker's friend Antonio Holmes, it was one of the most horrifying crash scenes in Hollywood history. It was consumed by flames, he asserted. There was nothing. They were trapped. Employees and shop friends, we tried. We tried. We used up all the fire extinguishers, said Antonio. Walker passed away from the combined effects of thermal and traumatic injuries, whereas the driver, Rodas, passed away from numerous traumatic wounds. Alcohol and drug use were not found in either man. The Los Angeles coroner's investigator, Christy McCracken, described how the car was traveling in an easterly direction at an unsafe speed. For an unknown reason, the driver lost control of the car, which then partially spun around and started moving southeasterly. According to the report, the vehicle then hit a sidewalk before hitting a light post and a tree on the driver's side. The car spun 180 degrees due to the force of these collisions and kept moving eastward. The vehicle then crashed into a tree on the passenger side, caught fire, and burst into flames. Coincidentally, a CCTV camera installed high above the ground at a distance caught it in all of the footage. The footage shows a car taking a left turn onto another road, and after driving only a little further, it can be seen bursting into flames and dark smoke rising above the trees. A black car follows their path frantically as the explosion is heard. It was, indeed, one of the most tragic accidents involving a Hollywood star. John Lennon It was December 8, 1980, at 4 p.m., and a pleasant day in New York. Without raising a single suspicion, John Lennon took a moment as he left his Central Park West home to sign a record album for Mark David Chapman, a 25-year-old former security guard. Paul Goresh, one of the diehard Beatle fans, frequently spotted loitering outside the Dakota building, captured the moment on camera. John Lennon, his wife Yoko Ono, and their five-year-old son Sean resided on the seventh floor of that building. Late that night, Chapman was waiting in the shadows with a stubby 38 handgun when the former Beatle arrived home. As Lennon and Ono reached the entrance of the building, Chapman shot five hollow-point bullets. Four of the bullets pierced Lennon in the back. Even now, the horror of John Lennon's brutal murder persists. The locations and activities of millions of people when they first heard the news are still vivid in their memories. For his own safety, it's unlikely that Mark David Chapman, who is currently serving a 20-year-to-life sentence at the Wendy Correctional Facility in New York, will ever be granted parole. Many people recognize Goresh's blurry photo of Lennon signing an album for Chapman because it has been reprinted all over the world numerous times. This final picture depicts the terrible irony of the situation a pop star showing kindness to his soon-to-be killer. It was going to be sold along with other four photos in May of 2020 at a posthumous auction for Goresh's collection of memorabilia, with a pre-sale estimate of $500,000 or more. 
The first few photographs showed John Lennon emerging from the Dakota building. He signed Chapman's album after that. Lennon then turned to face Chapman while holding a pen for autographs and set of cassette tapes in each hand. Then, just as Goresh's flash stopped working, he turned to face the camera, creating a ghostly image. At last, he arrived at the vehicle that carried him to the recording studio. The tragic irony is that Lennon was optimistic about the future as any chronically unsatisfied genius could be when he was shot and killed at the age of 40, having just resumed songwriting and record production after a five-year retirement. It had been almost 10 years since he had moved to New York from Britain. He was sick of being tied to his happy Beatle persona, even after the band disbanded, and he was outraged by the abuse that fans and the media had hurled at Yoko. Before being taken into custody by the police, Chapman stayed at the scene and continued to read The Catcher in the Rye. At 11.15 p.m., Lennon was transported in a police car to Roosevelt Hospital, where doctors declared him dead. Crowds gathered in front of the Dakota and at the Roosevelt Hospital, and at least three Beatles fans committed suicide due to their subsequent global outpouring of grief. Lennon was cremated the following day and inherited the Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. Later, Chapman admitted to killing Lennon. Michael Jackson Just two days before his passing, Michael Jackson gave his final stage performance, which was captured on camera. The star performs flawless routines with a large group of backup dancers. Michael Jackson was in a fiery mood as he took the stage at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. The Man in the Mirror star was practicing for his 50-concert London residency. This Is It, which was set to begin at the O2 Arena in just 20 days. However, 50-year-old Michael Jackson didn't live to see the UK event through. On June 25, 2009, just two days later, the celebrity was discovered dead in his Holmby Hills, Los Angeles residence. Michael took the stage with eight backup dancers and performed They Don't Care About Us from the singer's 1995 His Story album in a lively and note-perfect performance. The performer was at the top of his game, displaying his renowned dynamic dance moves the wide vocal range, and commanding the stage in a way that only the king of pop could. But the footage ends heartbreakingly. The star closes his eyes, turns his face upward, and smiles softly as the 1 minute and 53 second rehearsal comes to an end, bringing a powerfully emotional conclusion to the last known footage of him. Michael Jackson's vocal director for that tour, Dorian Holly, provided an insight into the star's activities in the days leading up to his passing, by claiming that Michael had been in awe of the magnificent sets that had been built. Dorian Holly, who had been working with Michael Jackson since 1987, remarked that there was something distinctive about the performer during rehearsals in the days preceding his passing. Even after years of collaboration with Michael Jackson, Dorian was still in wonderment about his vocal and physical prowess. At the time of his passing, there were conflicting reports regarding Michael Jackson's last words. Michael made two statements close to the end of his life, according to his doctor, Conrad Murray, who was later found guilty of involuntary manslaughter for his part in the singer's death. Michael had been receiving medication from Conrad before his death, and acute propofol and benzodiazepine intoxication were determined to be the cause of death. Conrad claims that the singer gave propofol the nickname Milk, which is why many reports claimed that his last words were a request for milk. Conrad stated that the singer specifically asked, as quoted by the LA Times, I'd like to have some milk. I know that this is the only thing that really helps me sleep, so please, please give me some milk. Propofol is an anesthetic, nicknamed as such because of its opaque, milky appearance. Conrad was reportedly concerned about this because of Michael's hectic rehearsal schedule. In response, Michael said, Just make me sleep. Doesn't matter what time I get up. I can't function if I don't sleep. They'll have to cancel it. I don't want them to cancel it, but they will have to cancel it. According to Dr. Connard, who was the last person to see the pop star before he was rushed to the hospital, these were his final words. His license to practice medicine and give out potent sedatives was suspended during the trial and has remained suspended. His ex-wife, Lisa Marie Presley, revealed Michael's last words to her, highlighting his precarious mental state at the time. The year after Michael's passing, she said in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, It was a very long conversation. I was so removed, and he could hear it and feel it. James Dean On September 30, 1955, near Colombia, California, an automobile accident claimed the life of Hollywood actor James Dean, aged 24. 
at the intersection of California State Route 46, formerly known as U.S. Route 466, and California State Route 41, where he had previously competed in a number of auto racing competitions and where he was en route to a sports car racing competition, he was involved in a car accident. There will never be another actor with the late James Dean's bad boy appeal or natural talent. The 1950s star, who was recognized by Time magazine as the most promising young cinema actor of 1955, had become a recognized heartthrob as a result of his performance in Rebel Without a Cause. On September 30, 1955, a fatal head-on collision involving Dean's Porsche 550 Spider on a California highway ended his flourishing career at the age of 24. Along with his friend, mechanic, and photographer, the actor was traveling down Route 466 in his well-known red car with the intention of attending a weekend sports car race. Then a Ford Tudor came barreling down the road on the wrong side. Dean tried to sidestep the Tudor, but his car collided head-on with the other. He took his final breath in his friend's arms as he passed away then and there. He reportedly said, that guy's gotta stop, he'll see us, as his final words. Donald Turnipseed, the Ford's driver, miraculously escaped the collision with only minor wounds. Like most famous people who pass away young, Dean's legend only grew after his departure. And a final eerie photo of Dean, taken in the hours preceding his fatal 1955 collision, quickly rose to fame as one of the most well-known celebrity photos of the 20th century. One of the last known images of the deceased actor portrays him in good health. At a gas station in Sherman Oaks, California, Dean was seen in the picture filling up his Porsche, which he dubbed Little Bastard. After filling up, Dean got back in his car and sped off to the location where he embraced death. Blackwell's Corner General Store, the gas station, now honors Dean with a massive cutout of his face at the entrance. Strangely, Dean's death was shrouded in legend and mystery. Before his tragic passing, Dean made a PSA for safe driving, telling viewers to take it easy, the life you might save might be mine. His beloved Porsche was often referred to as cursed by many. In his 1985 autobiography, Blessings in Disguise, the late actor Sir Alec Guinness claims that he warned Dean about the car. Marilyn Monroe Following a visit from her psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph R. Greenson, on the evening of August 4, 1962, Marilyn retired to her room around 8 p.m. while carrying her hallway telephone extension, perhaps a bottle of medication. Since there were no wireless phones at the time, Marilyn had to lug the phone and its lengthy extension cord down the hallway into her bedroom. That evening, she made several phone calls, one of which was to Peter Lawford, who had introduced her to the Kennedys. Lawford became disturbed when he received this call because it sounded like a final goodbye to him. Instead of paying a personal visit, Lawford claimed that he contacted Monroe's agent, who then called Marilyn's house. At around 9.30 p.m., Marilyn's housekeeper, Eunice, answered the phone. She saw the phone cord trailing into Marilyn's room and quickly assumed she was okay. Nobody knows how many calls Marilyn made that night or to whom she made them to because phone records for that address mysteriously vanished that evening after being confiscated by the phone company. In the early hours of August 5, 1962, Green Police Sergeant Jack Clemens received a phone call from Dr. Hyman Engelberg informing him that Marilyn Monroe had died from a pill overdose. After driving out to the modest home in Brentwood, Sergeant Clemens found Dr. Engelberg, Eunice, and at least one other person leading him to Marilyn's bedroom. Marilyn's naked body was sprawled face down and diagonally across her bed, her left hand resting on the telephone on the nightstand. Next to the phone were multiple empty prescription pill bottles, one of which contained many Nembatol and coral hydrate capsules. A more thorough search revealed no glass that could have been used to help the pills down. Upon inquiring about the bathroom, Eunice informed Sergeant Clements that it was out of order and had no running water. Sergeant Clemens made another interesting observation when he noticed Eunice doing laundry and cleaning up around the house. When questioned, Eunice stated that she wanted the place to look nice because she knew the coroner would eventually come and rope off the house for the crime scene investigation. Sergeant Clemens discovered Marilyn's body to be in an advanced stage of rigor mortis, indicating that she had been dead for some hours. When pressed further, Eunice admitted that she had noticed Marilyn's locked door sometime after midnight. Eunice got worried after a few knocks, but there was no response and called Dr. Engelberg, 
who was too unable to wake Marilyn by knocking on the door. The two circled back outside and looked into her window. They could only enter Marilyn's bedroom after using a fireplace poker to smash the window. It was too late, though. The 36-year-old actress was already deceased. Before Eunice contacted the authorities, four hours had passed. The untimely death of the legendary film star remains a daunting mystery to this day. Just a few weeks before Marilyn Monroe passed away in 1962, photographer George Barris captured these images, which are now up for auction on Paddle 8. Jim Morrison The lead singer of The Doors, Jim Morrison, a.k.a. The Lizard King, wrapped up his session with a whispered lyric run on the song Riders on the Storm from their most recent album, L.A. Woman, as he was leaving for Paris the following day. Little did he or the band know that would be Morrison's last time performing in front of an audience. At the age of 27, Jim tragically passed away from a heroin overdose on the 3rd of July, 1971. The world was shocked and his fans were devastated by the frontman of Doors' untimely death. But unlike Jim Morrison's brief time on Earth, the mysteries surrounding his passing have persisted for much longer. Officially, his girlfriend, Pamela Corson, discovered him dead in a bathtub in Paris. Without performing an autopsy, French officials declared that Jim Morrison's cause of death was heart failure. He was quietly buried in Paris's Pierre Lachaise Cemetery before the world learned what had transpired. Shortly before that, on June 28, 1971, Jim Morrison took a day trip to saint louis de saint north of Paris, with his girlfriend Pamela Corson and photographer friend Alan Roney. Roney documented the journey with joy and, unbeknownst to him, provided us with the last images of Jim Morrison alive. Morrison was in Paris after finishing L.A. Woman, an album that critics hailed as one of their best and a testament to the band's poetic and influential position in the musical world. He decided to travel to Europe to get away from the friends he'd gather around him in California. What a great idea, man, Ray Manzarek said when Morrison announced his departure for France. Manzarek himself wanted to encourage Morrison to get out of the cyclical intensity of the Hollywood crowd. They were sucking his energy, sucking his essence, Manzarek later explained. The next day, Jim left for Paris, leaving the band to finish the recordings without him. He was to arrive at a flat set up by his girlfriend Pam, who was also a significant influence in convincing the rock star to settle down in the French capital in order to restart his writing career. He quickly became accustomed to the life of wine, smokes, cheese, and bread, that Paris always provides. Despite calls from the band in June of that year to take the new music on the road, Jim was finding the benefit of Parisian life and put off the suggested tour for a little longer yet. His last pictures depict him as a happy man. They portray him as an artist who is enjoying being himself once more as an artist. This was Jim reborn and appearing ready to beat The Doors' frontman once more. He had a new record in the bag and a new contract ready to go. Jim no longer wanted to be a rock star and was not constrained by hangers-on or associates anymore, but it had yet to materialize. Tupac Several shots were fired at Tupac Shakur on September 7, 1996. The rapper and his bodyguards got into a fight with 21-year-old Crips gang member Orlando Anderson in the lobby of the MGM Grand Casino after leaving a boxing match with former Death Row Records CEO Suge Knight. While watching the same Mike Tyson fight, Carol, a member of the city's bike patrol unit, was unaware of the altercation in the lobby. Later, as Knight and Shakur were halted at a stop sign, a white Cadillac pulled up next to them, and one of the men inside started shooting out the back window. The first policeman to arrive at the gruesome scene was Carol. Carol claims that he asked Shakur for a dying declaration of a potential suspect, but that the rapper initially ignored him. Shakur, according to Carroll, remained silent even when another officer attempted to elicit a statement from him inside the ambulance. As soon as he arrived at the hospital, he underwent surgery while being heavily sedated. He went into a coma, never really recovered, and was eventually removed from life support. Pock and Suge Knight drove down the Las Vegas Strip in the Death Row Records CEO's 1996 black BMW 750IL after the ill-fated Mike Tyson vs. Bruce Sheldon fight when a 29-year-old UCLA film school student named Leonard Jefferson had an encounter with the soon-to-be-dead rap icon. That later became a part of a more prominent legend than the two. Jefferson got the chance to interact with Pac later that night for what would have become his final photo op. He revealed in an interview that he came to a stoplight at Harmon Avenue. He looked over and saw some shiny rims on a BMW. 
He noticed it was Pac and Shug. He recalled, I said, yo, what up, Pac? And paused for a second, then recognized who I was and said, yeah, what up, man? He asked them what they were doing that night, and Tupac said they were going to Club 662 and he should come over. Jefferson said, all right, cool. Hey, let me grab a picture really quick. My camera was in the center console, so I just grabbed it and then snapped that picture. Jefferson stated that they pulled off right after the light turned green and they made a right turn. Around 11.15 p.m., the BMW was attacked, shooting Shakur four times and sending him to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada. Jefferson clearly remembers that unsettling imagery till the present. I got on my phone and called California Pizza Kitchen to cancel my order. All of a sudden, I heard pop, 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 pop. All of a sudden, I see the black BMW turn around and take off. It made a wide U-turn right in the middle of the street and started following Shug. It was a procession of cars, like two or three. There was a Lexus that the security guard was driving. I had a 96 Chevy Suburban. You can see it in the reflection in the picture I took of Pac, Jefferson vividly remembers. Freddie Mercury The last known image of Freddie Mercury was taken in private, just months before he passed away. The picture shows Freddie standing in the garden of his cherished residence, Garden Lodge, in West London, which was taken by his longtime partner, Jim Hutton, on August 28, 1991. The celebrity can be seen posing with one of his cats in front of the Georgian home, framed by leaves and grinning at the camera. The image provides a glimpse into Freddie's final months spent at home. That summer, Freddie posed for a camera for the very last time. Mine, remarked Jim. He further said, I was out in the garden photographing some of the flowers in full bloom, and Freddie walked towards me. I trained the lens on. He wanted to move back a bit, so it wasn't a close-up. Then he posed while I took four pictures, and he managed a smile for each. Jim Hutton noted that despite being one of the most photographed people in the world, the images of the frontman of Queen held a special place in his heart. In his memoir of the star, he stated, He was so pale and drawn that he knew he didn't look his best, but it didn't matter a bit. Of all the pictures I have of Freddie, those are the ones I love most. Mercury died in his Kensington home on the evening of November 24, 1991, about 24 hours after issuing a public statement. He was 45 years old. Bronchial pneumonia, caused by AIDS, was the reason for death. When Mercury died, his close friend, Dave Clark of the Dave Clark Five, was at his bedside. David Bowie When the news of David Bowie's death was announced, there was an outpouring of tributes, and fans shared what they believed to be the superstar's final photograph. The photo was posted on David Bowie's official Instagram account on January 8, 2016, which was also his 69th birthday and two days before his death. Bowie died on January 10, 2016, at the age of 69, surrounded by family after a courageous 18-month battle with cancer. The photograph, wildly regarded as his final professional portrait, was taken by Jimmy King, a friend of Bowie's, who had photographed him numerous times over the years. It is unknown when the photograph was precisely taken. Jimi Hendrix Jimi Hendrix is a legend, not only because of everything he gave to his devoted fans, but also because of his tragically early passing, which devastated them forever. It has recently come to the world's attention that the photos you'll see here are the last ones ever taken of the well-known musician, as if that weren't depressing enough. They are joyful pictures of him and his girlfriend, Monica Danman, enjoying life and seeing the sights while she snapped photos of her beau. Here are Jimi Hendrix's final images. On September 11, 1970, Hendrix gave his final interview to the record mirror at the Cumberland Hotel in London. Hendrix was found dead in his girlfriend's apartment at the Sam Markin Hotel in Notting Hill, just two days shy of his 28th birthday. After already being in poor health due to an outgoing bout of influenza and exhaustion from work, 